this is one of a couple of dozen of creativity conversations that we've had on campus, and they've all been um, insightful and enlightening in new ways. And actually, um, this is kind of an important week for me because the, the series was inaugurated accidentally, as some of these things happen in life. Um, when I was asked by our library, the Manuscripts and Rear Book Library, the Woodruff Library, to lead a public conversation with uh, Sir Salman Rushdie, um, a few years ago, and um, I said, sure, I'd be happy to do that, and then I started thinking about all of his work that I hadn't read yet, so I you know, started reading madly and then had this incredible conversation with him, um, and had been the second in a conversation with him uh, in a public forum with him just yesterday afternoon. But in between those, which were you know, quite extraordinary, were other scholars, scientists, uh, many artists, composers, people such as Philip Glass, or our own Natasha Trethewey, um, and just a wide range of people. And, and one of the ideas is not only to highlight and to probe, really, avenues of creativity and thoughts about creativity, but, th but the concept behind it is that there is a creative spark in each one of us, and that that can somehow be ignited something by, sometimes by what people may say or how they may think about things. And uh, so this seemed like a particularly wonderful opportunity. Martha and I have had many, many casual conversations. Uh, I think some of them have been creative, and certainly about uh, creative works. And um, when, when you first came here to Emory, there was a quotation from one of your colleagues that said, um, no legal scholar has done more to make us view old questions in a new light. And I think that um, when, when I was thinking about creativity in the law, and for those of you who are lawyers, not everybody automatically who's outside the law sees uh, the legal field as being a creative field. Um, but when I, I thought about that quotation about how you reframe questions, ask, and the, the reframing process in itself seems like a creative act. And I'm wondering how you yourself, Martha, see your own work as creative. Well, I think um, the reframing arises because um, I'm always looking for the underlying assumptions uh, and not satisfied to a kind of accept the status quo. Um, and I suppose that that's creative because it takes some imagination, first of all, um, and it also uh, occasionally introduces new ways of thinking and approaching things. So um, I like that. It's the fun part of, wh of what I do. Um, is making myself and then subsequently other people uh, think about things a little bit differently. Right. And so how did, how did you learn to do that? I mean, most of us um, are, are prepared and willing just to take on the answers to questions that we receive to as, uh, right. assume the assumptions. I, that's a very difficult question to answer. And um, I think you're, <clears throat> you're asking me to articulate uh, a process that's really more intuitive than, mm -hmm. than not. Um, it's just the way I, I always remember myself being calling into question um, received wisdom. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't always make me very popular with my parents, for example, <laughs> or teachers mm -hmm. or, or others. But um, it served me well in my, in my life. Are there, are there times when there are assumptions or that you're just not willing to question yourself, that you find some your own intrinsic resistance to it and think, well, I can't go there, or that's somebody else's issue, or, or it feels like it's undermining sacred territory in some fa form or fashion. Yes, yeah, sacred territory. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to think of what that might be. <laughs> <Yeah>. um, <laughs> I, I don't think that there are areas, at least not that I'm aware of, that I'm afraid to question. I mean, there are areas that when I question them, I am afraid, but uh -huh. not afraid right, to question. Right, right. So what happens when you do that and you're afraid? Do you, just, do you persist in that, or do, do you ever find that an obstacle to pursuing that? I, I find it um, difficult to stop once I've started right. in a thinking process mm -hmm. to actually stop. Um, I really would have to, uh, to work at that and probably be unsuccessful. So you mentioned that this creative process for you is about, a, a lot of it is about questioning the assumptions um, and a lot of it is intuitive, but does it, do you feel like you have, uh, have developed over time at least, but you might not have had initially, a process for thinking through things in a kind of more systematic way about, about pushing those boundaries or questioning the assumptions? Um, 
again, it would be difficult to articulate any mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I can say that I trust myself in a way that uh, I think perhaps some of my colleagues don't. I, so I trust my own instincts. And um, I often feel like I've backed myself into a, uh, an intellectual corner. Mm -hmm. And usually that's a very productive exercise because you, you, know, then you proceed from that position mm -hmm. wh where you are. So um, I guess. So can you give an example of that, where how something took you into a place where it, it, it landed you somewhere that you didn't expect to go and then kind of felt like a predicament, I right. guess? Well, I, a recent ex fairly recent example is actually how I got to the vulnerability concept. Right. Um, because I had done a lot of work trying to refashion or rethink what equality meant, and I actually um, suffered quite a bit in my early career because I critiqued the idea of equality as a, a model or a way to approach family issues. And uh, of course, this was um, uh, the feminist reformers mm -hmm. and others were extremely uh, concerned and upset when I did this because equality was how they wanted to think about gender relations. But I thought it was inappropriate in the context of the family. And from that experience, I developed this idea of dependency and actually a theory of dependency. Um, and when I talked about that, I, again, I was criticized. Sylvia Law told me um, my work was dangerous and why didn't I write fiction instead of the legal scholarship? And <laughs> I, I questioned uh, whether writing fiction was less dangerous right. than legal scholarship, which five people read, but um, <laughs> uh, fiction seemed a more dangerous thing to pursue. But in any case, the, uh, the whole dependency critique was criticized, um, and I, I kept pursuing it and its significance uh, to society and to individuals um, and its inevitability and its derivative forms. Um, and, and, and it was criticized uh, as episodic and just occasional and people aren't always dependent. Mm -hmm. So what we should think about the legal subject as, uh, you know, the fully formed adult individual, which led to the theory of vulnerability because while uh, dependency might be episodic, vulnerability is constant and universal. So it helped me to then to think my way out of the problems with dependency to, to the concept of vulnerability. So sometimes, it sounds like sometimes it's necessary actually to get backed into a corner in order yes. to be able to rethink, um, you know, where that corner exists in the structure right. of our thinking and our, and our lives. So you can redraw the configuration. Yes. Right. Actually, architects say, using kind of architectural metaphors like mm -hmm. corners, that, that the most interesting projects are the ones that have the most constraints. Yes. And so if you have, you know, a really big budget, well, you know, those are not so common these days, but maybe in Dubai or someplace, but you have a really big budget, you have a lot of land, you have, um, you know, a lot of openness, that the, the projects usually don't come out as interesting as the ones that you right. have really. Um, so on this I idea of vulnerability, do you see any kind of relationship between being vulnerable um, which, uh, as I understand it, is something we all share. Yes. It's part of the human condition. Yes. So it's it not, is the human condition. It is the human yes. condition. So it's not specific to individual populations or no. individual people in their place in society. No. But we experience it in different ways. Yes. And, and some people are more vulnerable than others? Or differently vulnerable, uh -huh. yes. Um, but it, it is a shared, universal, constant part mm -hmm. of the human condition. And as, as you said, uh, it's both universal but also particular, mm -hmm. so that we experience our vulnerability in different ways. And of course, the, um, one of the major reasons for that is the, the command of resources that we have as individuals. And where my project leads eventually, as all my work always has, is back to this question of equality. Mm -hmm. So I'm still interested in equality. Which is where you started. Which is where I started. Um, but now I'm interested in inequality through the lens of vulnerability and the arguments that society has a responsibility to ensure equality of access to these resources in order for us to uh, have resilience in the face of our vulnerability. And so do you see any relationship on the topic of creativity and the relationship between vulnerability and creativity? Well, it, actually, it's related to what you were saying earlier. The most difficult projects mm -hmm. are the ones that uh, require the most creativity. I think that when we realize our vulnerability, um, when we actually are aware of it, that it makes us afraid. Mm -hmm. And it, it makes us seek 
resources, mm -hmm. and that is a creative process mm -hmm. in and of itself. Is a, an important part of your job, obviously, here in the law school, but also more broadly in the university, is as a teacher as well as a scholar. And do you think that we can teach innovative, creative thinking in the classroom? Can we teach? No, I think we can encourage it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we can teach it. Maybe we can model it. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to imagine teaching it. It's, uh, well, again, I have difficulty articulating the system, system right, or process, it, right, so right, right. it would be hard to teach. Right. So um, as you think back to your childhood, so a lot of times um, you know, who we've become is a product of many, many different experiences. Um, did you see yourself pursuing any of the, you, you've already indicated that perhaps your parents always weren't wildly enthusiastic about some of your questionings, um, but did you see yourself as moving in this kind of field or towards this kind of work, or is this something that you wanted to become? Or No, no. Um, I was the first person in my family to graduate from high school, wow. not college, but high school. <laughs> Um, and uh, <clears throat> my parents had been told when I was in high school that um, I didn't have the intellectual ability to go to college and I had been tracked into um, commercial courses, shorthand, typing, um, you know, commercial math. So actually, um, I uh, did graduate from high school. <laughs> 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 um, uh, and uh, I probably got married at the age of 17 and had my first child when I was 18. So um, I, that's what I envisioned for myself uh, coming from a real working class background and that's what young women aspired to in those days and I did that too mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, had a second child and then <clears throat> left uh, that husband when I was 21 for the unknown world of whatever. Mm -hmm. So you started questioning some of the assumptions at that point? Is oh, that, is, is well that the before point? then. <laughs> but, but very specifically, yes. you, yeah, a, yes. lot of times, a lot of times people who have had a, an interesting or innovative career kind of trace it back to, usually it's a series of moments, but sometimes there's one particular moment where you kind of took a left turn when you were expected to take a right turn. Yeah, I did a lot of wrong turns <laughs> <laughs> but I but I again I think that I I don't regret that because it really gave me a basis for seeing things that I, many of my colleagues don't because they come from a much more privileged background mm -hmm. so I think um, in a way creativity or at least my version of it could be linked to um, to aspects of disadvantage mm -hmm. I mean that um, I, I think what, there's that old saying, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it also makes you more creative. And so when you started your academic career in college, then did, the, when, when did you begin to see yourself um, moving more in a direction that might be called a scholarly direction or a legal direction? Was it once, once you were in college or? Uh, yes, I was, I was really happy to get to college. Um, and I was a Temple Opportunities Program admit, which was a program for disadvantaged city kids who didn't have the prerequisites for college. And I started off at night school and then uh, met my second husband while I was in college. Um, and I was just, you know, the whole world of intellect. I, I used to have a dictionary and I would write down what I thought had the self spelling of words was that I didn't understand and would go home and look them up and, and that sort of thing. So it was a, a whole process of learning on many, many different levels. and. Um, when I was in college, I uh, became very excited by ideas. I was uh, given a lot of encouragement by teachers, and that was really very important to me. And I decided that I wanted to go to law school, so uh, <laughs> not knowing at all what I was getting into. I, I didn't know any, any lawyers, but I decided I was going to go to law school. And I uh, thought, oh, maybe I'll be the first uh, Supreme, Sup women Supreme Court justice at that point. So, of course, I didn't, didn't do that. I did something else instead. Um, so yes, college did. It opened up a lot, of, a lot of doors, but more importantly, I think individual professors opened mm -hmm. up a lot of doors for me. So you had some people along the way, maybe starting especially in college, that who served right. as mentors to you or right. guides to you? Yes, well, yes, not, 
so much guides, but they encouraged me. I mean, they recognized that what I was doing was good. Um, so, for example, in a history class, I instead of doing a paper, I wrote a play. And the wow. professor encouraged that and was really very, you know, he liked the fact that I did that. And um, So what was the play about? Oh, my goodness. What, what was it about? Well, the Reformation, I think. So. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of good material there. Yeah, right. <laughs> But, um, and the papers that I wrote, I mean, you know, I would do these papers and they would give me like A pluses and they would be excited about the ideas and so it was, it, it really just fed something deep inside mm -hmm. of me that I hadn't even really known was there before. So in terms of thinking, okay, well, I'd like to go to law school, but you don't know any lawyers, what, what was it about the field of law that drew your attention, your energy, your imagination? Well, um, remember, I'm a, a child of the 60s, so um, uh -huh. I really thought I could use law to change the world. Uh -huh. um, and that's what I wanted to do, because there was a lot I was dissatisfied with. Uh -huh. So now I've given up on that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you've certainly influenced things in the world. Yes. You've had, a, you've yeah. had an influence. And if, if you hadn't gone to law school, what, what, what paths do you think you might have pursued? What other paths might you have pursued? I, you know, I think about that a lot. I, uh, when I started law school, I had um, my two children from my first marriage, and my twins were five months old. And um, I, I so think... So how old were the two older ones? Uh, they were eight and ten. Uh -huh. Yeah. So it was a, full. a full house, yes. yes. <laughs> um, and I often think that if I didn't have the children, right, mm -hmm. and uh, that I probably would have chosen to be a starving artist, but you really can't ask your children to, right. to do that. Uh -huh. so. Well, speaking of that, um, you know, I know you have interest in creative fields outside law. Um, you, I've seen you at concerts at the Short Center. Um, you and I frequently talk about books, just kind of on the sidewalk in passing. Okay. always have a you know, roving bookmobile conversation. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I know you're also interested in visual art. You're, do you art work yourself, is that right? Yes, I do, yeah. In fact, I just had a, a glass making um, class this past Saturday. Uh -huh. I made a piece of glass. That was exciting. What other kind of artwork do you do? Um, I'm mostly an oil painter, uh -huh. although I've done some etchings and some printing and some other sorts of things like uh -huh. that, but mostly it's, the, uh, it's oil painting. And, and I'm sure you have plenty to do in your, um, your work here. Why do you do this? What, what's, what, what, what is it that, the, that you get from that, or what is it that you give to it? How is that different from the day job, so to speak? Well, it's both different and the same in some ways, and I'll come back to the similarities. But um, when I'm working on a piece of art, it takes my entire attention. It is so absorbing that there is nothing but that creation and one of the reasons that I like oil so much is its physicality right. it's so you know when you work with the paint it's just it's just comes alive and it's it's totally absorbing and it, it's a, such a um, creative thing mm -hmm. to do it just makes you feel very much alive um, and and I love that in fact when I'm really into painting I dream about the colors and I wow. dream about the texture and it just alters the entire way that you view the world mm -hmm. it uh, speaking of framing right. it becomes framed through the through the medium itself through, through the art um, so and, I, and I have you studied art have you studied visual art you I said took, you just took a class I took my first art class when I was 50 mm -hmm. it was my birthday present to myself right. And I had doodled and done, you know, things before then. But um, I, I was—I took it. I was at Columbia at the time, and I took it at, um, at Woodstock, uh, at, the, at the Woodstock Art School. And um, the teachers again said, "Oh, you were really talented." And of course, um, I wasn't afraid to experiment because I was successful in my mm -hmm. professional life, so I could afford to take a lot of risks in my artistic life too. And um, and I did. And I became a member of the Woodstock Artists Association. And in fact, in Woodstock, I'm known as a local artist and not as a law professor. <laughs> so I have a dual identity. Um, and uh, and that was, that's meant a lot to me. And it's actually meant a lot uh, to, to have that. And you said there are some ways in which it's the same as the study of Yes, yeah, someone once said to me who was familiar with my artwork and my scholarship that I did in my scholarship the, what I do in my paintings, because I'm very interested in taking things that people don't necessarily think belong together and putting them into the painting. There, it's oil painting, but 
the um, is it abstract? Uh, expressionistic. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I, although I've started to do some abstract work lately, but it's um, but it's different things on different planes, and so it's like a montage or a collage of different things. So I might have, you know, a, a vase of tulips next to a young woman on a rocking chair, with behind, you know. So it's just like a juxtaposition. Yes, yes, and different. So it's it's kind of interesting to me. It's an in, in, interesting problem, intellectual problem. The how you make things that don't belong together work together. Mm -hmm. There's a kind of surreal aspect to that. This yes, and that's, this person said they saw the same thing in my scholarship. <laughs> well, I wouldn't call it surreal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you think that means, that your scholarship is surreal? I, I interpreted it to mean that it was eclectic, uh -huh. and it was pulling from, and again, back to the questioning assumptions, pulling from lots of different areas, putting things together that other people wouldn't necessarily think belonged together mm -hmm. in a new and interesting way. Right, right, yeah. which is a part of the creative process. So after you have worked d on your artwork, do you, do you find that shifts or changes the way that you think about the world or about the, the scholarship itself? I mean, do you, do you see an influence? Is there kind of, a, we, you talked a bit how the art is similar to the law work because it has that, yeah. um, bringing of things together, but do you, does, it, does it change your perspective at all when you go back to? I, only to the extent that I see, you know, I'm seeing things mm -hmm. in, a, in a sharper way. Um, right. But I don't know that, I, I would think that it runs the other way, actually, so that the feminist and the, some of the intellectual uh, energy mm -hmm. that I bring to my scholarship influences the artwork. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's the way it would run. Speaking of um, feminism, and we've already talked a, a bit about this, but over our lifetimes, the, the, the role, the place, the position of women in our society has, has changed in some pretty dramatic ways, mm -hmm. certainly in law schools, yes. for instance. Um, and you know, one thing, my understanding of um, women's studies, feminism, uh, that is very common is that women's lives don't always follow a linear or traditional path right and your your life is an example right. of that and yet we live in a world that somehow that, that is the assumption right right that there there you will do things in a certain way according to a certain order how else has has feminism and and in addition to the arguments that you've had with feminists at some point how mm -hmm. else do you think feminine is, feminism has informed the direction and currents of your life well, again, it's looking at things that other people didn't necessarily notice. Um, so that when you're a woman who's who's ambitious, as I, as I was, extremely ambitious, um, and you're trying to to do things, and I, I just remember I can remember so many times being told no, right? Uh -huh. And when I was a student at the University of Chicago um, Law School, I, Soya, Soya Menchikoff had been there as a faculty member, and she left to become dean at Miami. And some of us got together and asked that there be another woman appointed to the faculty. And we were told that there wasn't a woman in the country smart enough to be on the University of Chicago law faculty. Mm -hmm. um, was she the only woman on the faculty yes. at the time? Oh, yes. And she was only there because she had been married to Carl Llewellyn. But that's another story. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, And things like that happened all the time. It, it, it just was, uh, you, you were constantly being told that women weren't good mm -hmm. enough. and and so forth and so on. And of course, that was exactly the kind of thing that I had to, to fight back mm -hmm. against. Um, so it, it was, it, I, it, but again, I think it was good because it made me think about the ways in which those people were wrong mm -hmm. and why they were wrong to, to be imposing those sets of assumptions. So um, I do think things have changed quite a bit for women. Uh, I don't think they've changed as much as they should. Mm -hmm. And I also think that we experience a, a new form of tokenism, um, and that's still very much in mm -hmm. evidence. And when you say things haven't changed as much as, as they, they might or should, what, what other changes would you envision or hope for or expect to see? What uh, the pioneers of today right. Right. moving into some of these areas, what, what are the, some of the assumptions they should be questioning? Yes. Well, I, I mean, I do think it's important that women are assume 
positions of leadership. Um, and I think that there's still, we used to call it the glass ceiling. I'm not sure what to call it today, but I, I think that that's still in evidence in many professions and certainly in law. Actually, the um, ambassador to India was on campus um, last week and um, she was asked a question by an Emory freshman. Um, why is it that in India, for example, they might have um, leaders of their country who are women, whereas in the United States we don't right. so much? And um, she, she, had an, she had an interesting answer to that, which I'll share with you in a second, but do you have any thoughts about that? Why cross-culturally in some ways in the U.S. we're not as advanced as having women leaders? I, for, for example, I've never had a woman president in the United States. Well, some of those countries um, actually have quotas for women. Mm -hmm. in, interestingly enough, in the in the parliaments and legislatures, right. they must have a certain number of women. And again, back to the problems I had with early uh, in the early feminist struggles, um, it, we re reject that notion of, of quotas. We reject the idea that there have to be things like that put in into place to have women succeed. Um, so. What, we don't. <laughs> yeah, what her answer to that question was, is was somebody else there in case I don't get this quite right, but she, what she basically said was that in India, if you are in the, if you have the privileges that go along with your place in society and you have the education that is available to you and the opportunities that are available to you, there really is not much of a glass ceiling. Mm -hmm. um, so, so if you're already in that privileged role, in society, then you're not going to have the glass ceiling. However, if you're not there, right. um, then you have a lot. You you are, in fact, extremely vulnerable. Um, and so, I think there. I think she was saying that perhaps in our society, there's a little bit more evenness, perhaps, um, but there's not as much opportunity at the at the upper levels, for those reasons. That that was that was her theory on that. You you've talked a little bit how teachers have influenced you, and maybe sometimes. Um, people who are opponents or mm -hmm. take the opposite side have influenced you, right? right? Um, are there major public figures um, or leaders or thought leaders who've had an influence on either the way you think about yourself, um, your work, or the world? Hmm. I, aside from obvious people like Martin Luther King. Right. Um, <clears throat> I, I don't think so. I think most of the people that have really made a difference to me are people that wouldn't be uh, well-known public figures, mm -hmm. but um, just people who, who really took the time to listen to what I was saying and, and um, take, take me seriously, and that was what I needed. So it was more on the personal relationship right. rather than having somebody who you say, okay, I'd like right. to be like this person right. in the world. And when you use the term vulnerable populations, we've talked about it a bit, specifically referring to women and your analysis around dependency and vulnerability, especially around families. But that, that idea of vulnerability, again, is part of the human condition. And so it extends to all kinds of people in all kinds of situations. Yes, and it also extends to institutions um, uh -huh. because part of the theory is that institutions themselves are vulnerable. And in fact, that's one of the things that terrifies us the most. Um, in the book that I'm working on, I use three examples of vulnerability or where, where Americans were, have been faced with our vulnerability in ways that we can't ignore that occurred during the first uh, decade of the 21st century. One, of course, is 9-11. Right. Um, the second one is Katrina. Mm -hmm. uh, and the third one is the economic crisis. And it shows, again, that no matter what you do as an individual, you can't protect yourself from your vulnerability, nor uh, can society protect you. And in fact, sometimes it's the institutions in society that themselves create or, or worsen um, our vulnerabilities. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a rather comprehensive and involved theory, and it's been getting a lot of a, a wonderful attention internationally, and I have a lot of people coming uh, to learn more about it and to, and to think about it with me, so it's very exciting. So there, there are legal implications for understanding that vulnerability? There are legal implications. I spent um, several months last year in Ireland talking about all of that, and there are some legal institutions uh, in that society that really, I think, um, express where I hope uh, thinking about vulnerability and taking it seriously mm -hmm. might take us uh, as a society where, where we aren't uh, in the United States yet. Do you think it changes where we are, um, 
sit kind of, I guess I'm going to use this word, existentially. I mean, that, that once you come to terms with the idea of being vulnerable, yes. then it, it places you, you, you place yourself or you're placed yes. in different contexts. Yes, and you ask different questions. Uh -huh than when you think you can be invulnerable. And again, the opposite of vulnerability is not invulnerability, but resilience. Um, and the vulnerability never goes away. And I think um, one of the reasons, or one of the things I like about 9-11 is it also shows if we resist and deny our vulnerability, that the fear that arises when we're confronted with it can be used in, in ways to manipulate us and to do things like take away certain kinds of rights and to do mobilize society in oppressive ways right. so that I, I think a failure to see our vulnerability is very dangerous. Um, and you and resilience then is a quality or a, a way of being a state of mind. And, um, no more than that resilience our, uh, resilience comes from again the command of uh, uh, we have over assets or resources uh -huh. in order to let us respond to our vulnerability. Um, and there are different kinds. There are material resources, certainly, bank accounts. There are, um, uh, you know, wealth, a variety of things like that. There are um, the resources that we have, human capital, right. capabilities, our education, a variety of things like that. There are also resources from intimate relationships, our families, our union membership, if we happen to be in, in Wisconsin, um, <laughs> um, just for, that give us, you know, strength. But there are existential re, uh, right. resources like religion or uh, being uh, identifying with certain groups, uh, uh, give, things that give us uh, a, a notion of why we're in this mm -hmm. world. So the, these resources come from a variety of societal institutions, and it's the access to those institutions that I think the state has a responsibility to, to ensure for all citizens. Uh, and, and of course, what, uh, we live in a society where access is unequal, mm -hmm. uh, very unequal. And, um, and so that's where I want to take the vulnerability project to, to examine how, how we can change that or how we can begin to address that. And so you, you have um, been, let's use the word, um, innovative or pioneering or creative in asking these questions and um, questioning the assumptions. But it seems like one also has to be creative in how you pursue your next steps or how you kind of try to implement these ideas, um, which is, I mean, you, you said earlier, you know, it, if you write something for a law journal, a handful of people might read it, right. as opposed to, let's say, a best-selling novel or even any kind of novel or people have Kindles, um, you know, some, somebody somewhere might have read it. Um, but, but it sounds to me like there's a step you want to take beyond that, beyond legal scholars and law students, mm -hmm. um, lawyers being aware of this. There's some impact that you want to have on society, in fact, perhaps even changing the world. Yes, but I think you change the world like one mind at a time, uh -huh. you know, so that, that's why I teach. Right. Um, and I do an awfully lot of workshops and I have visiting scholars that come in. I, um, I do a lot of networking, so I, I get the ideas out there. It's, it, it does happen. Um, and I, I do, actually my work is read by more than five people at this point. No, I, no, that, I, I know that. In fact, yeah. I, I think I'm aware of that. I, I, I was, the, I, I was the, the most cited um, family law scholar in the United uh -huh. States, according to Brian Leiter's blog, and Barbara, my good colleague, Barbara Woodhouse, was number three or four. Oh, yeah. Anyway, but there we are. So together, uh -huh. very, very yeah, right. powerful. Yeah, I wasn't meaning to imply <laughs> that not many people read it, but that, but that a, a, um, a certain, you know, a certain group right. of people right. might read it, right? And although I know right. your scholarship goes way yeah. beyond that, and so the idea then that you're suggesting is that the way, the the way society might change, the way institutions might change, the way they do change, is by people rethinking. Yes these very ideas. Yes, and I, I think that's right. You have to change the vocabulary mm -hmm. and you have to change the concepts that people are using. And that, you know, that's what good scholarship does. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really makes you rethink things that you've taken for granted. That's why they call it groundbreaking. Groundbreaking, so you, you yeah. change the terrain, the right. actual terrain. Um, I, I'd be interested in your thoughts about, um, one more question about resilience, and I want to go a slightly different direction. 
is resilience, the kind of resilience that you're talking about, is that something that we can teach ourselves, something that we can learn? How, how, how would I learn, for example, to be a more resilient person in order to inform the work of the university mm -hmm. or um, to inform anything that I do? Um, how, does, how does one gain that attribute or that quality or that perspective? Yeah, with, well, the way I think about it, it, it comes from uh, having the tools, realizing that you have the tools to, um, to address the situation in the context that you, in which you find yourself. Um, so I don't know that you can teach resilience any more than you can teach creativity. Uh, but, uh, but again, you can provide the resources for people to take them and to use them and to employ them. Um, I don't think you can do it for them. Right, so, but sometimes it is about opening up doors yes. or windows. It's very much about that and, and as I said we live in a society now where I mean how you can say that that some child that's growing up in you know in a poor neighborhood in Atlanta uh, going to public schools that are underfunded mm -hmm. and so forth and, and so on, that they have the same opportunities as a child who has a, a wealth of resources available to them, that they're on an equal footing is it's ridiculous. Well, let's talk about universities for a second. Um, so you're a Woodruff professor yes. here at Emory, so that you're, you're here in the law school, but sh the Wood Woodruff professorships are really university appointments, as I understand it, yes. right? So, and I, and I know you're a university citizen, a very active university citizen in a lot of ways, but if you wanted to kind of model in a university these ideas around um, awareness of vulnerability and the importance of resilience, um, what, how, how would you create that? What would it look like in a university? Setting? Well, we are creating it. And um, in, in fact, vulnerability and the human condition is now an interdisciplinary initiative that comes under the graduate school. Uh, and everyone should look at our website. You can get it through emory.edu backslash vulnerability. I'll take you there. Um, it's very creative. Mm -hmm. I, I designed it myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, the thought behind vulnerability is actually it was a, a way to unite uh, all the graduate schools with the college because nursing and medicine and even business, there are even people in business that are interested in the concept of vulnerability. Uh, law and the humanities, of course, uh, and social sciences, very interested in working around vulnerability and, and resilience. So we're we're, um, we're already doing that. Mm -hmm. We're in the process of building that kind of community. Right. So a lot of it is around picking an important idea or theme, right. and then bringing the best yes. minds and the most dedicated people right. to really making. Um, to, to raising an awareness right. of that. And I think that uh, Emory is becoming known internationally as the place uh, where vulnerability is happening. Mm -hmm. um, and if you Google vulnerability, we turn up number one. Wow. <laughs> um, and uh, Sweden, sent, they sent two scholars uh, recently to come and to talk about vulnerability, and now I'm invited to Lund um, to, you know, to you know, talk more about vulnerability. I'm going to, um, been invited uh, to Scotland and um, to meet with some members of the Scottish Parliament, actually, to talk about vulnerability. Uh, and so, it, you know, again, mm -hmm. the idea, uh, the idea carries itself forward. So it has it, a certain universality yes. to it. When you look at take that lens and you look about what's happening in the world today, even right. as we speak, in um, Egypt, Lib Libya, Middle East, um, around. How do, how do you use the concept of vulnerability to help you understand these world affairs? Um, well, I don't understand those world <laughs> affairs. I don't want to uh, overstate my capabilities here. Or just um, to think about them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I think about the, those events in terms of missed opportunities rather than vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. but. Uh, so what does that mean, missed opportunities? Well, I mean, it, it, just thinking back to the, some of the decisions that were made by various administrations and foreign policy mm -hmm. and so forth that um, perhaps could have been different and things would have turned out differently. As you work with students and young scholars, what, what kinds of what advice do you give them as they try to fashion a creative life? Uh, as well as a uh, creative work. Yeah, the um, best advice that I ever got myself was from Murray Edelman, who was a political, very famous political scientist. Um, 
and uh, I actually was sitting in when I was on the faculty at Wisconsin, sitting in on a class that he was doing on postmodernism. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, everybody was trying to figure out what that meant, um, and me too. And uh, <laughs> so I was sitting in on the class, and uh, he was teaching, and we talked about this afterwards because there were a lot of things about deconstruction and some of the moves in postmodern scholarship right. that were interesting. And he said to me, and, and I think this is really excellent advice, that you take the strongest parts of lots of different areas. So classical scholarship, postmodern scholarship, critical theory, whatever it is, you mm -hmm. take what you need and you use those tools to fashion something for yourself. And as back to the uh, collage aspect of my artwork mm -hmm. and the collage nature of my my scholarship that's I think the best advice and again it, it has to do with trusting yourself mm -hmm. trusting your instincts um, and keeping your mind open mm -hmm. so um, is there any ever danger especially as you talk to young people about this or people who are just starting out on their work is there any danger that in that kind of eclectic that eclectic um, look that there's a, a lack of depth but a, a breadth of, of information or inputs. I thought you were gonna ask me about a different kind of danger. Uh -huh. Well, <laughs> uh, we can talk about that too. <laughs> because there are dangers, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, I, well, no, I mean, you have to do, you wanna do things well. Right. If you're really doing interdisciplinary uh, work, then you wanna understand the disciplines that you're using. So I'm not saying do it in a shallow way, mm -hmm. but you know, but again. But what are some of the other dangers? Well, <laughs> um, the dangers are that you're misunderstood and, and, uh, and, and worse. I mean, when I was, uh, I wrote um, what I called a post-egalitarian analysis of, of families and uh, almost didn't get tenure at the University of Wisconsin as a result mm -hmm. because people were so shocked. Of course, now, many years later, everybody's, not everybody, but mm -hmm. most people have come around to my way of thinking. But at the time, there was a real, mm -hmm. a real danger in that. And I used to, um, when I would go and talk about my ideas, I would have uh, what I called the truth squad, which were the people who had been uh, working so actively to reform the family law to make it equal gender, uh, gender equality, the norm. And who, they would come and they'd pull their chairs up and kind of confront me in these public meetings. Mm -hmm. So that w there's uh, always that danger. And um, so I think there are consequences when you're right. thinking differently. Um, but that's exciting mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. So you find you don't find that intimidating. You just find that as an opportunity to just try harder. Right. Or do Do you have this experience where you've tried something a certain way? You know, five, ten, fifteen, a hundred times, and it's not working. So you you step back and you circle back around to it a different way? And maybe you did around equality, maybe that's yeah, a good oh yeah. example. Of yeah, I c I've never tried something five, 10, 15, 20 times unsuccessfully and not change my uh -huh. position. <laughs> yeah. I think that that would be one good thing you could say about me. I'm, I, I was actually, speaking of, of Barbara Woodhouse, we, um, uh, Barbara, the, the, this, we had an interesting exchange and Barbara may not even remember this, uh, 10, 15 years ago, something like that. Um, and we were both doing a, a, a conversation, a, a presentation, and um, I was taking uh, a, a stand in favor of family privacy, and she was concerned with the abuse of children. Um, and I was concerned with uh, the lack of privacy leading to the oppression of, of women. So we were here in actually I was very upset because was I was that with I, here, here. No, no, no. This was Washington D.C. or something. Yeah, this is Washington. Because I, I thought she had accused me of being in favor of child abuse <laughs> in front of a room full of like 200 people, um, and um, I was so angry with her. And you know, I let her know that. And then I went back to my hotel and I, th I thought about this and I thought this is really ridiculous because I, I love her work. And um, so I we invented at that point what uh, I called uncomfortable conversations, which mm -hmm. were an opportunity to bring together people who agreed on a lot of fundamentals, but at these, in these corners, mm -hmm. disagreed, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so we brought together advocates for women and advocates for uh, children in, uh, against child abuse. And we, we put them in a room and we talked to each other and we talked across our differences and things like that. It was very, uh, again, very creative, very mm -hmm. productive uh, way to do things. So, um, right, so. 
Well, two things from that example um, are stri strike me. First of all, that you, when you first said you don't do something five or ten or twenty times the same way without kind of sh shifting your strategy, yeah. that's a kind of that that is a kind of resilience. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily the sort of structural um, kinds of resilience, but mm -hmm. it's a kind of personal resilience that you know, kind of okay. Well, these are what my values are. This is what I'm trying to accomplish, but this isn't right. working. And so, how do I how do I reshape myself and my ideas? The other thing is that it sounds like um, that creativity sometimes comes out of, we talked about corners, but also sometimes comes out of conflict. Absolutely, yes. And so that in allowing that conflict to occur, but creating, again, a frame for thinking about it. So not saying, well, you know, I'm only going to deal with those people that I'm not in conflict with, or I'm going to avoid, or I'm going to continue this argument that doesn't really make any sense, but, um, but reshaping the conflict itself, or right. giving an opportunity for it to rise. Taking advantage of conflict. I mean, I think when I um, first started to write about vulnerability, uh, it occurred to me that when you get this realization, I mean, it's when things are in conflict or in transition or f kind of falling apart, that that's the opportunity for change then. Uh, if, if things are too stable, um, then there's a lot of resistance to change. So there's something about the destabilization process. I, right. I, 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 I do hear a number of writers and artists who, you know, also say that about themselves, mm -hmm. that when they feel like they're in a destabilized right. situation or position, and I think scholars as well, that's when something, so both kind of an internal destabilization, but also an external one. Right. And that's why I think um, a lot of people like me put ourselves into positions, new positions, or positions that cause us fear. Mm -hmm. um, because it's that, I mean, that's what allows you to, to actually see things, begin to see things a little differently. But um, universities and schools of law tend to be very traditional places. I mean, oh, and, yes. and a frequently very conservative places. Yes. So there, is there some kind of paradox there that in one of the more conservative um, bastions of society is this um, fermenting of, of, of creativity or, or conflict or yes. questioning. Yes, I, I uh, wonder about that myself. <laughs> like why, why am I here sometimes? It's, uh, I'm, I'm not all that, that clear about it. But, but then I get the most wonderful and interesting students and mm -hmm. that is, is great. And sometimes uh, younger colleagues who I just find so exciting. So, um, and and there, there's a certain way in which being in a law school gives you a kind of credibility that if I were in the humanities, it, I w would not necessarily have. So if I were writing those novels, I might not mm -hmm. be taken quite as seriously. So maybe Sylvia was right. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one of your early mentors. Well, um, I, th so that leads me to close with this last question, although I'm sure we might have time for a little bit of Q&A with other members sure. here. And so we've talked about fiction and novels a bit here and there, and we never have a conversation, Martha, without talking about what you've been reading. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> or what you'd like to read. What I'd like to read. Now, I, 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 I read Jonathan Franzen's um, The uh, Corrections, I believe, mm -hmm. and I have, and I want to read his The Freedom right. book, but I just have not had an opportunity to do that. I've been, um, I've been really, really busy. I have three books in various stages mm -hmm. of completion at this point, so I'm kind of overwhelmed by that right, right. now. Right, so that's taking up. And, yes. and, and so those three books, again, are? The There's a, a book on masculinities. Mm -hmm. um, there is the vulnerability book, which is going to come out with Princeton Press. And then I'm working on um, a book on incarceration and human rights. Mm -hmm. And once you check those off the list, although they sound yeah. like really big, fascinating, yeah. and f fully engaging pro projects, once you kind of check those off, what, 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 what else is out there that you want to look hmm. at and think about and work on? I, I actually, I, I, what I want to do is take a painting vacation because uh -huh. I've, I have put down my brushes for, for far too long. Right. And I've, that's one of the reasons I took the, um, the glass making class. Uh -huh. Um, and I, I also bought 10 hours of studio time to go and, and continue making these glass pieces and we'll see how it turns out. It's something new, but I do want to I do want to do something like that for a while and put the, put the computer away for a while. Yeah.